Hey guys, Zambus here, and welcome to the second part of Reading the Silver Eyes by Scott Cawthon and Kyra Breed Risley. So, if you have not watched this video, please watch the other one of Hans Fraser's Silver Eyes, 1 to 50 page. And yeah, please listen right now. I'd recommend you to wear headphones. Okay. She didn't remember much about the first couple of years here. She had been only three years old, and the memories faded together in the blur of the child's grief and loss, not understanding why her mother and mother had to go away, clinging to her father every moment, not trusting the world around her unless he was there, unless she was holding tightly to him burying herself in his flannel shirts and the smell of grease and hot metal and him. The, the stairs stretch straight up in front of her, but she did not move directly to them, going instead into the living room where all the furniture was still in place. She had not really noticed it as a child, but the house was a little too large for the furniture they had. And so things were spread out too widely in order to fill the space. The coffee table was too far from the couch to reach, and the easy chair too far from uh, across the, from the room to carry on a conversation. There was a dark stain in the wooden floorboards near the centre of the room, and Charlie stepped around it quickly and went to the kitchen. There were the cupboards held only a few pots and pans and a few dishes. Charlie had never felt a lack of anything as a child, but it seemed now that the unnecessary enor enormity of the house was a, was a sort of apology. The attempt of a man who had lost, it, lost so much to give his daughter what he could. He had a way of overdoing whatever he did. The last time she was there, the house was dark, and everything felt wrong. She was being carried her, she was being carried her up the stairs, being carried her up the stairs to her bedroom, although she was seven years old, and could have gone quicker on her own two feet. But Aunt Jen picked up her, uh, picked her up as they stopped on the front porch and carried her, shielding her face as though she were a baby glaring in the, a baby in the glaring sun. In her room, Aunt Jen set her down and closed the bedroom door behind them, and told her to pack her suitcase. And Charlie cried because all her things could never fit into that small case. We can come back for the rest later, Aunt Jen said, her impatience leaking as, as th through as Charlie hovered in, in, de in de -sifly at her closet, <coughs> trying to decide which T-shirt to bring along. They had never come back for the rest. Charlie mounted the stairs, heading to her old bedroom. The door was open, and she, and as she opened it, she had a giddy feeling of displacement, as though her younger self might be sitting there along her toys. Look up and ask Charlie, Who are you? Charlie went in. Like the rest of the house, her bedroom was untouched. The walls were pale pink, and the ceiling, which sloped dramatically on one side, following the line of the roof, was painted to match. Her old bed still stood against the wall, beneath a large window, and the mattress still intact, though the sheets were gone. The window was cracked slightly open, and the rotting lace curtains wavered in the... wavered in the gentle breeze from outside. There was a dark water stain in the paint beneath the window, spreading to the mattress where the weather had gotten in over the years, betraying the house's neglect. Charlie climbed into the bed 
and forced the window shut. With a screech, it obeyed, and Charlie stepped back and turned her attention to the rest of the room. To her father's inventions, her, their first night in the house... Charlie was afraid to sleep alone. She did not remember the light, but her father had told her about often it often though that she had ta that the story had taken on the quality of memory. She sat up and wailed until her father came to her to find her until she until he scooped her up and held her and promised her he would make sure she was never alone again. The next morning, she took her hand. He took her by the hand and led her to the garage, where he set work to work keeping that promise. Of the first of his inventions was a purple rabbit, now grey with age from years of sitting in the sunlight. Her father had named him Theodore. He was the size of a three-year-old child, her size at the time. He had plush fur, shining, deep, shining eyes, and a dapper red bow tie. He didn't do much, only waved a hand, tilted his head to the side, and, and said in her father's voice, I love you, Charlie. But it was enough to, to give her a night watcher, someone to keep her company when she could not sleep. Right now, Theodore sat in the white wicker chair, in the far corner of the room. <clears throat> Charlie waved at him, but not activated. He would not wave back. After Theodore, the toys got complex. Some worked and, Char and some did not. Some seemed to have permanent glitches and others simply did not appeal to Charlie's childish imagination. She knew that her fa she knew her father took those back to his workshop and recycled them for parts. Though she did not want to watch them dismantled, but the ones that kept that were kept, those she loved, and they were here now, looking at her unexpectedly, smiling. Charlie pushed a button beside her bed. <coughs> it gave way stiffly, but nothing happened. She pushed it again. She pushed it again, holding it down longer. And this time, across the room was a weary creak of metal on metal. The unicorn began to move. The unicorn, who Charlie had named Stanley for the reason she could no longer remember, was made of metal and had been painted glossy white. And it, it trundled around the room on a circular track, bobbing its head stiffly up and down. The track squealed now as it rounded the corner t and came to a stop beside where Charlie sat on the bed. She got down and knelt beside him on the floor, plat patting his flank. His glossy paint was chipped and peeling, and his face had given over to rust so that his eyes gaze live lively out of decay. You need a new coat of paint, Stanley, Charlie said aloud. The unicorn gazed ahead, unresponsive. At the foot of the bed there was a wheel, made of patched-together metal. It had always reminded her of something she might find on a submarine. Charlie turned it. It stuck for a moment and then gave way. Rotating as it always did, across the room, the smallest closet doors door swung open and out sailed Ella on her track, a child-sized doll bearing a teacup and saucer and saucer um in her tiny hands like an offering. Ella's plaid dress was still crisp and her patent leather shoes still shone. Perhaps in the in, um, closet she had been protected from the damage of the lamp. 
Charlie had an identical outfit back when she and Ella were the same height. Hi, Ella, she said softly. As the wheel unwound, Ella retreated to the closet again, the door closing behind her. Charlie followed her to the closet wall. The closets had been built to align with the slate of the ceiling, and there were three of them. Um... Ella lived in the short one, which was about three and a half feet tall. Next to it was a one foot or higher, so and and a third, Clo closest to the closet door, closest to the bedroom door, were, was the same height and the rest of the room. She smiled, remembering. Why do you have three closets? John had demanded. The first one time he came over, she looked at him, blankly, confused by the question. Because that's how many there are. She said finally, then, defensive, she pointed to the littlest one. That one's Ella anyway, he, she added. John nodded, satisfied. Charlie shook her head and opened the door to the middle closet, or tried to. The knob stopped with a jolt. It was locked. She rattled it a few times, but it, but gave up with much, without much conviction. She stayed crouched low to the floor and glanced up at the tallest, cl or the tallest closer, her big girl closet that she needed some day to grow into. You won't need it much until you're bigger, her father would say. But that day never came. It now hung over slightly, but Charlie didn't disturb it. It had hadn't opened for her. It had only given time way to given way to time. Before she stood, she noticed something shiny, half hidden under the rim of the locked middle door. She leaned fo forward to pick it up. It seemed, it looked like a broken off piece of a circuit board. She smiled slightly. Nuts and bolts and scraps and tarts had turned up all over the place. Once upon a time. Her father always had a stray parts in his had stray parts in his pockets. He would carry something he was working on around, and set it down and forgot where it was, or worse, put something aside for safekeeping, never to be seen again. There was also a strand of her hair clinging to it. She unwound it carefully on from the tiny lip of the metal of metal it was stuck on. Finally, as though she had been putting it off. Charlie crossed the room and picked up Theodore. His back had not faded in the sun like the front of his body and was the same rich dark purple she remembered. She pressed the button on the face on the at the base of his neck but remained lifeless. His fur was th threadbare and and hanging loose by a single rotting thread and th and through the hole she could see the green plastic of his circuit board. Charlie held her breath, listening fearfully for something.